Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own with a friend or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rectumwell. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bible in a Year podcast. This is Luke Shortridge. I'm hanging out with Andy Rectumwell. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, as always. Luke, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. That's great. So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite books of the Old Testament, the yeah. book of Ezra. Ezra. Before we get to that, though, Andy, I have a very important question for you. Yeah. Have you ever been in a fight and what happened? Um, surprisingly, yes, I have. Really? Uh, I used to, as we covered in the intro podcast, I used to work security for a private security oh, yeah. firm. Um we worked in apartment complexes around the University of Toledo and also in some Section 8 housing units. Uh, Section 8 is government-provided housing units, that kind of stuff. So okay. there was always some, uh, a couple fights. The one that sticks out the most uh, was we had a guy who was um, really drugged up on certain kinds of pills and refused to leave the property because he was damaging things. And so I called for backup for my sergeant, and when he got there, uh, a lot of stuff happened, some mace tackling. I got to tackle somebody... Uh, we all ended up with skin, knees, and elbows and stuff, but it was uh, very interesting. Wow. Yeah. How did I not know this? Um, I don't know. I don't really talk about it. I'm not really proud of it. Three people against one, but we had to because we were all afraid that he was going to kill us or something. We didn't know what he had. He's wearing... So was this where you actually got to use your taser? No, I didn't have a taser at that point. It was like my first week on the job, and so I had a flashlight. You couldn't even be trusted to hold a taser. Well, I did later, and I used that a lot. Uh, you know, with people that were threatening me and stuff. <laughs> was it at least a mag light? Yeah, it was huge. It was a huge flashlight, okay. but what are you going to... I mean, if he has, like, a knife or something, I'm not going to go, but I got a flashlight or a gun. It's like, oh, yeah, try and shoot me. I'll block it with my flashlight. So, no. I'm having visions of Paul Blart right now. I'm not going to lie to you. Come on, man. I wasn't a mall cop. I didn't have a... What are they? Segway. I didn't have a Segway. You weren't a police officer. I know I wasn't a police officer, but we still tackled him. We had to. All right. So I was in a fight once. You were. This was in high school. This better be good. Well... <laughs> So there was a guy much larger than me. By the way, not many people know this. In ninth grade, I was exactly five foot tall. So I've always been kind of small my whole wow. life. Wow. Yeah. So I was taller than I you got, in the ninth grade. I got let's let's not make a big deal out of this. That's awesome. I got picked on quite a bit. And there was this guy in gym class that kind of targeted me. And I have to say, when you are in junior high or high school, the worst two minutes of your life is the locker room oh, yeah. experience before and after gym class. Yep. Why you have to get changed in front of your peers, I don't know. That's like a cruel joke that's played on high school kids. Yeah. So I'm getting changed. I'm feeling vulnerable, self-conscious, et cetera. And this guy comes out of nowhere, starts harassing me. And <laughs> I, I don't know if I can say this on the podcast, what he did. It was blank twister. <laughs> okay, I, you can fill in the blank there. You know what happened to me. It was horrible. I, I was just shocked. I didn't know what to do. I felt, you know, I felt embarrassed. He throws me up against the locker. I'm like, you know, on the verge of tears, trying to act tough, and he says a few choice things to me. So after that, I just run. I go to gym class. I, I'm like. The whole time there, I'm feeling horrible about this. I'm avoiding the guy. I'm trying to play it cool, but oh clearly I've been gosh. crying. It's horrible. This is one of the worst experiences of my life. Wow. So, Not much of a fight. But I know. <laughs> no, it wasn't a fight. But I know I've got to go back, and I've got to change back into my normal clothes after gym. You, you can't get around. Right, you have because to. Because you, you can't wear sweatpants in school. So I did, though, tell one of my buddies, hey, this thing happened. This guy might be after me. Can you help me out? <laughs> and my buddy's name is Brent Paroli. He's our IT director yeah. here at Cedar Creek Church. Been best friends with him since second grade. And Brent, while I was small, Brent at ninth grade, I mean, he'd been shaving for two years. <laughs> you know, he is ripped. The football coaches are trying to get him to go out for the team. He's no interest, but he's a big dude. Yeah. So this guy, Rick, comes after me again afterward. I knew he was going to, and sure enough, he did. So he comes at, at me, starts saying some things. This flash comes out of nowhere. Brent throws him up against the locker, pummels him a few times, and I, like, got changed quickly. We get out of there. Brent didn't get in trouble. Wow. Saves the day. Brent Paroli. Yeah. Oh, Man. yeah. He saved me. I'm going to watch out for him from now on. He was my knight in shining khakis. I don't know. 
He was <laughs> he helped me out a ton. <laughs> Our producer's losing it right now. <laughs> All right, we, we need to get back to Ezra uh, here. Yeah, so we're in the book of Ezra. The reason why we asked about this is because sometimes you need a protector. You need somebody who is watching out for you, someone who has your back, and very much during the book of Ezra, God is a protector of the kingdom of Israel. Yeah. The kingdom of Israel had went through some very difficult times. They are ransacked. Their young men are stolen away. They're mm-hmm. living in exile in other countries. This already small geographical country for 60, 70 years are living as foreigners in a different land, but God hadn't forgot about them. Yeah. He was still there, still protecting them, still watching over them, ready to jump in and help them wherever needed. Yeah, so let's get into the uh, context of the book. As always, we want to give you some context so you know why uh, what's going on is important, what's happening in history, that kind of stuff. So the purpose of the book of Ezra is to tell the story of the returning exiles. It's to provide like warnings for sin and to give lessons uh, for living successfully, even in the midst of opposition. Yep, that's right. So the author is not specifically named, but it's probably Ezra. Uh, Most people think that he helped write somewhat of the book of Chronicles, at least maybe edited it, and this is his story. Ezra is a scribe and a priest, Mm -hmm. and he's pretty much saying what happened during his lifetime. Yeah, so who is he writing to? Uh, The original audience is Israel in general, but specifically uh, to the returning exiles. Right, so our time period here is about 450 B.C., our setting, it's in two major movements, so we have the return of 50,000 Jews from Persia to to Judea, from Zerubbabel, which is a very fun name to say. He's the guy who leads the first people back to Jerusalem some 80 years after the temple is destroyed. And then Ezra leads the second wave of the Jewish people back, probably about 2,000 of them, to rebuild their community. Yeah, so here's some of the key people. The first is Cyrus, the king of Persia. He captured Babylon and established a policy, this is crazy to me, that allowed Jews to go back to their homeland uh, to rebuild the temple. Which doesn't make a lot of sense. No. You think about Pharaoh not wanting to let his slaves go back to In their the midst homeland. of all the plagues. Right. And the king of Persia, Cyrus, just lets them go. Yeah, and then you have the next king, Darius. He uh, then reaffirmed Cyrus's policy. So God is clearly in control here. I mean, this is not just happening right. in the midst of human action. God is helping the Israelites out to go back to restore some of their former glory. And speaking of that, Zerubbabel... As I said, he leads the first wave back, but there are still problems. It's not glorious. It's a difficult job. He's trying to rebuild the temple, and he has much opposition as he tries to do this. Yeah, then we have Ezra, who is like one of a uh, he's like a personal hero of mine because of his commitment to God's word. He was a scribe and a priest. He led the second group back to Israel uh, to rebuild the community. He worked actually alongside of Nehemiah, which is the book we're going to cover next time, uh, during the rebuilding of the walls. He showed willingness to practice know, and know God's word and how, how doing that can reveal amazing results and, last, and a lasting effect on one's life. Ezra is an awesome guy. He, as you said, is deeply devoted to the Word of God. There's several times in Scripture where he is just reading the Word of God to the people yeah. and is able to do that in a way where they repent of their sin. They decide, yes, God, we will obey you, as your Word says. He was deeply committed to the Lord and got amazing results yeah. throughout his lifetime. So, Andy, why don't you tell us some of the mega themes that we will see in this book? Yeah, so the first is the returning exiles. God, um, he protected his people even through the difficult time that they went through being in uh, captivity. He made good on his promises to return them, which God always does. He always makes good on his promises. Yep. Uh, no matter how difficult our present captivity may be, whatever that looks like for you, for me, for Luke, uh, God doesn't abandon us. Love it. Another key theme is the rededication of the temple. This was a huge symbol of national pride, and the fact that the temple had been ransacked, destroyed, would have been a huge blight on the Israelites. So the idea that we need to rebuild the temple, it was also a central place of worship. So if they were going to worship God correctly, as the law had stated, the temple needed to be rebuilt. Yeah, the next uh, theme is actually opposition. So even, it's like right when they start to go rebuild, uh, they are met with opposition. We'll read about a couple characters that are involved in that. And at one point, they stopped the building for six years because of that opposition. So it's a huge theme in this book. Absolutely. And the last theme would be God's word, just the importance of having God's word be center in our lives and the power that God, God's word has to convict 
and to help to change people's hearts and their lives. Yeah, so here really quickly, I'm going to outline uh, the book of Ezra. So from chapters 1 through 6, we read about the return of the exiles um, and the rebuilding of the temple. And then we'll finish off with 7 through 10, where the uh, Ezra returns and they rebuild the community. Cool. So every week we want to give you guys an opportunity to dive into God's Word with us. We hope that you will follow along as we're reading. We're going to be reading out of the New Living Translation today, so if you have a Bible handy, you can pull that out. If you want to switch over to a Bible app so you can read along with us, that would be great. If you're listening on your own, I would encourage you get a journal. Start journaling some of the questions that we're going to ask. If you're listening in a group, we would hope that you would stop the podcast to take a minute and discuss some of the questions that we lay down for you. Yeah, so we're going to begin, guys, in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read that, and then we'll talk about it. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. This is crazy. This should not be happening. Why a king all of a sudden would just decide, all right, I'm going to let my slaves leave my care, go back, rebuild this symbol of national pride, and oh, if the people in my kingdom would help them as well by giving them their wealth on their way out, that would be great. It it really doesn't make any sense other than God was behind it. He was directing this. Right, and it it looks like, and he probably didn't know about the prophecy that Jeremiah, um, the, the prophecy that Jeremiah talked about. Uh, where it talked about the people going back and rebuilding under the the different uh, under captivity, so that's just crazy to me. And like you pointed out, that is uh, key, and it, it shows that God is involved. It's not just a king; it's God directing all of this. Right, and it it may have been that he hoped to win the loyalty of the Jews more by letting them go, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. I think. Like if you read in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 44, verse 28, there's this prophecy that at the time didn't make a lot of sense. This prophecy was 150 years before these events happened. And Isaiah says, When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. Isaiah is speaking for the Lord. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will say, restore the temple. Again, when Isaiah writes this prophecy, Maybe even he himself is questioning, is this really going to happen? But that's exactly how it goes down. Cyrus was not Jewish, but God used him in a big way to carry out God's purposes. So yeah, um, when you face difficult situations or feel surrounded, outnumbered, overpowered, any of that kind of stuff, remember God, he's not limited by your resources. So a question we wanted you guys to talk about right now is, think about a time God used an unlikely source to speak to you or teach you a lesson. And what happened as a result? Well, I have one story that kind of goes to this. I previously, before I was a campus pastor, was the associate pastor. And part of that is the community care duties. So people sometimes need help uh, financially or maybe to help with the water bill, something like that. So there was a guy that came to us. He was a committed member, volunteer, uh, was having some trouble making ends meet and asked for help on his water bill. So I said, okay, no problem. I'm not going to say the city, but let's say that I had some trouble with the city that this water bill was going to of paying it. First off, they didn't have online payment, which I was kind of irritated about (laughs) because it's 2013, 14, who doesn't have online bill paying, but they don't. You got to actually go there. So I call their office. I talk to this woman. She's short with me. She's not very helpful. I'm trying to figure out okay, is this the right place I go? What kind of check does it have to be? Can it be a company check, a personal check? She cuts me off and says, you know what, you're going to have to just come in and hangs up. So I'm already (laughs) mad. I'm not in the best frame of mind. So I show up, the guy's there. We walk in and I just had a bad attitude. So the guy that I'm going to help, he calls this woman by name. Uh, We'll just say that her name was Jenny, although it wasn't. He says... Jenny, uh, how's your dad doing? And she stops right where she's at, and she says, you know, he's not doing very good. He 
has cancer. He's at the last stages. I'm the primary caregiver. In fact, after I leave my shift today, I'm going to go back, and I've been in his house every night this week. And he says, I, you know, that that's so horrible. Um, I've been praying for you. I'm going to continue to pray for you. Um, just know that I care about you, and I care about your dad. Um, tell him that we're praying for him. In that moment, I was so convicted yeah. because I show up as the pastor to help this guy. I had a bad attitude toward right. Jenny. And the guy that I was trying to help, he acted way more pastoral than I did in that moment. I really think that God used that experience to just have me do a little bit of a heart check to figure out why am I doing what I'm doing? Okay, I'm there to help people, but did my heart reflect the actions that I was supposed to be carrying out? Yeah, and I think uh, that's crazy. God can do that all the time is use people that you wouldn't even expect to teach you. Right. You know, about his character and about his plan for you possibly. Um, Okay, so then... After this, the Israelites begin to rebuild the temple, and you have this really weird scene uh, where there's like the older generation and the younger ones in their view of the new temple build. All right, so we're going to pick it up in Ezra 3, verses 10 through 13. When the builders complained, the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed, with praise and thanks. He sang this song to the Lord. He is good. He is, his faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joy shouting, joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. This is a it's odd it's an odd scene. It is weird. Why do you think the older generation wept? I think they probably wept because they had seen the old temple. Yeah. They had seen its glory. Uh, it, it was certainly one of the wonders of the world. Yeah. Uh, the amount of opulence, wealth, the mastery of the construction that went into it. It yeah. was so detailed that the older generation knew we're never going to get there again. Um, it, it took generations to build and to maintain we're just not going to get there again. So I think they wept because they knew what was lost, and the newer generation had no idea. They were pumped. Right. They so were super excited. They were excited. Hey, yeah. the temple's being built. This is a great thing. Yeah. So you had some people who were weeping. Uh, may have been happy tears, but probably not. Probably not. And then you also have people rejoicing at the same time, uh, and both are, are praying to God and singing to him at the same time as well. Yeah, and I think that what really what you see here is it doesn't really – matter about the what the what the temple is going to look like because it wasn't going to be the same as it was before they didn't have near the resources they did before right there even are, with the help there are of the people king. who have just been ransacked and destroyed for 60 years right they don't have what they used to have what god cared about was the heart behind the temple it was done with the spirit of restoring god to his rightful place uh, uh, as central to the people of israel and so that again goes back to a common theme of the entire bible and that's that heart is is, it's very important, and heart determines actions, and even when the Israelites are getting resources from the most powerful king in the world um, at the time, it's still not going to compare to the way it was after Solomon built it. Right, so. and I, I think you bring up a good point in that no matter how great the temple was built, it's still not going to reflect the splendor of God. No. And what we, you know, fast forward a little bit, I don't want to give the story away, but when the temple is destroyed again and rebuilt again, it yeah. happens a few times, uh, eventually, when Jesus comes on the scene, he talks about the temple being destroyed and then being rebuilt in three days. Yeah. And th- the Jewish people thought it was blasphemy at the time. This guy's going to destroy the temple. You know, he's yeah. like one of the evil invading tribes coming to get us. But the, the truth is that no structure built by human hands, no matter how glorious it was, can ever be a proper home for God. And we find out later that when the Holy Spirit comes and actually indwells within believers— the Bible talks about there being a living temple, that the stones are the church. The yeah. members of the church, the people, will actually house God, that as he built our bodies, we actually become the temple of God, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's a little bit new age right, there. Yeah. But when you accept Christ into your life, the Bible says, and it's a promise, that the Holy Spirit comes, live within you, that in a way that is then God's temple. Now, does our glory reflect the Creator? 
Most of the time, not. Probably <laughs> not. Uh, but we certainly, you know, that's that's how God wants it to be. That yeah. we would honor God with our bodies and with our lives. So the question we want you guys to talk about is: Do you believe that God cares more about who we are than what we accomplish? Do results matter to God? Why or why not? Uh, for me, I think about some cool events that I've got to be a part of in student ministries. One of which was uh, it happened this past year. Um, we called our foam party. We had a an attendance. I heard for, all about this, by the you way. You did. I was very glad it didn't happen at White House. Yeah, I mean, Fortney, he just gave us the go-ahead. So we put a big foam machine. What a beast. In Fortney's the South Toledo campus pastor here at Cedar Creek. And we put a foam machine in the auditorium. And we had a little pit. We corned it <laughs> off so it didn't just spread everywhere. And the kids just partied in the foam pit. Um, and then we presented the gospel, and that was really cool, too. You know, that was the greatest part of it. Um, but the event went really, really well. Eric was out of town. Our directional leader was out of town. Uh, and Chad Schramm, our, our student ministries pastor at White House. So we were already a little bit short as a team. Love you, Chad. Yeah, Chad, you're a great guy. So is Eric. So is Eric's great, too. So uh, basically, these guys are out of town, so we're short-staffed. And uh, I was given the opportunity to lead the team. And it went really, really well. Um, nothing major happened bad that, that we had to talk about or whatever, figure out how it's to not do it again. shocking yeah. in student ministries. It is. I mean, but we did no really, injuries. really well. We, we, we try really hard not to be the typical youth group that makes a lot of bad decisions and uh, gets in trouble a lot. We try to be pretty professional and have a lot of fun. So it went really, really well. Um, and we had a lot of kids there, highest attendance since the year before. So uh, I could sit there and I could celebrate my accomplishments all that I wanted. But I, I know because I've been taught by people that have mentored me that accomplishments aren't everything and the numbers aren't everything because uh, the way God works through you and what God can do is more important. And so here's the here's the weird thing about it. Mm-hmm. If I celebrate all my wins, that means when I lose, when I do something bad, when the numbers don't hit what I want it to be, then right. I got to take credit for that as well. Right. You know, and, and it, the reverse is true, too. Sometimes we're in a church that's growing and it's it's big. And so if I always get down when the numbers aren't where they're supposed to be, then I could pridefully take credit for when the numbers are high. Right. So either way, I, I believe that God cares more about me and my development as a person and as a Christian than he does about what I accomplish. But I do think that results matter to God. I think that he, that's why he has like the book of Numbers and he talks about uh, yep. genealogies or I'm sorry, this, the uh, censuses and that kind of stuff because he does care about results. Absolutely. God, God does care about what we do, but at the end of the day, he is rooting for us. He cares about us. Yeah. He's pursuing us and he is well pleased with us as well. Yeah, for sure. So now we're going to move into Ezra 6. Uh, Luke's going to read 21 through 22. The Passover meal was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and by the others in the land who had returned from their immoral customs to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Then they celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. There was a great joy throughout the land because the Lord had caused the king of Assyria to be favorable to them so that he helped them to rebuild the temple of God the God of Israel. This is cool. The festivals start happening again. Ezra was all about the festivals, and these hadn't been practiced for a long time, and God actually tells them, you need to party, which is kind of funny, but he does. He says, you need to celebrate. I think it's important for all of us to take times where we celebrate what God has done. We're we're in a culture where it's very instant gratification. You live in the moment, you live for now, you You don't look back. Right. And because of that, we often don't learn from our mistakes. We keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. Yep. So God tells them, take a minute, stop. Don't work right now. I want you to celebrate what has happened in the past and celebrate the great victories that you've already achieved and the ways that I've helped provide for you in the past as well. Yeah. So a question for you guys is, do you have any family traditions and does it, how does this help establish your family identity? So we have a great short ridge tradition that I have to tell you about. It's called the squeezer. Have you ever heard of it? The squeezer. Yeah. So no. this was instituted, as far as I know, by my father, but probably maybe his father before him. And the squeezer is simply you are riding in a car with someone and you say, hey, do you see that out the window over there? I think that's a squeezer. And then they look and you squeeze their leg really hard and say, squeezer! <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. That's a squeezer. That's a family. Does it hurt? Um, it hurts. Or is pride. it just weird? It's weird. Mostly weird. Okay. I, but I do plan to pass this tradition on to my kids someday. <laughs> okay. They don't think I'm funny. But how does that help to establish your family identity, though? Um. Well. And <laughs> I, I I don't know how to answer that question. Although to say that the Shirtridge men were a strange breed. Yeah. And. 
we like to have fun. That's that's all, that's all I can say. All right, <laughs> okay. please please salvage this podcast, Andy. Take us to Ezra nine two through three. Okay, this is Ezra nine two through three. Uh, says for the men of Israel have married women from these people and have taken them as wives for their sons. So the holy race has become polluted by these mixed marriages. Worse yet, the leaders and officials have led the way in this outrage. When I heard this. I tore my cloak and my shirt, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down, utterly shocked. So I, of course, is Ezra. Ezra is talking in first person. He knew this was strictly forbidden by the law because he knew the law. He had studied it, and he sees that the people of Israel are marrying with the people of other tribes. I think in today's culture, we kind of don't understand this. Yeah. You know, why this was such a big deal. You know, today, we very much believe that you can marry whoever you want to marry out of love. Um, That's part of ingrained in our culture today. This wasn't really a racial thing as much as it was a religious thing. Very. I mean, when you read the history behind the, and the people he's talking about, the people that surrounded the Israelites geographically, um, especially if you go back and read the book of Joshua, where God commands uh, the, the Israelites to go in and take over and destroy all the Canaanites. And it's a very interesting book, and it's hard to read sometimes as a believer because he commands to kill everybody. And yeah, really tough. Right. And, and like, but when you study what the Canaanites did, and, and that, that's the, all the pagan cultures, when they what they did was so atrocious. It wasn't just that they were different people, or as Luke mentioned before, it wasn't about race, anything. It wasn't about, like, their skin color or whatever. It was about what they were doing because they were worshiping false gods. So one of the things they did a lot of, and it gets mentioned um, in the Old Testament— is they would sacrifice their children to a god named Molech. And if you do any research on Molech, you see how they sacrifice the kids. And this is pretty graphic, but I think it brings the point home. Just how evil. Yeah, they they had this big structure that represented the god Molech, and there were little parts of the, it was a big metal structure that they would put fire in, and it would light it on fire, and they would put the children on top of this structure so that it would burn them alive. Mm. And that they thought that they were offering up their kids to this god. And so that, on top of bestiality and a bunch of other really just crazy sins, was what the Canaanites were known for. So his command to not marry into these people was not just because they weren't uh, Israelites, but rather because of the evil things that they were doing and then would cause the Israelites to do the same. Exactly. God knew that if they intermarried with these other tribes, their hearts were going to be swayed. Yep. Their hearts were going to be eventually far from him. We always think that, oh yeah, I'm strong in my faith. I'll marry somebody who's a few notches below and I'll just pull them up to where I'm at. Right. Doesn't happen that way. Here's the question that I want you guys to talk about or journal about. Why does God oppose a spiritually mismatched marriage? And if you find yourself in one, what exactly is the best course of action? Uh, I mean, when I think about this... This is heartbreaking. It's, it, it really is, and I think you can go back to Scripture and Solomon's downfall right. was a result of his marrying women that didn't worship the same God, and they pulled him away from God. But practically, if your faith is the most important thing to you in your life and you disagree with that, with a person that you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with on that key issue, how are you going to survive that at all? My faith is the most important thing in my life, literally. If I could not share that with my wife, if I could not connect with her on a spiritual level, I would be experiencing marriage far below what God intended. Right, yeah. There's few things, I think, in life that are really worth fighting for to really stand up and say, the culture has this one wrong. The culture has this one wrong. Yep. Having a spiritually mismatched marriage is a big deal. It's dangerous. It is dangerous because it affects your heart and potentially it affects your soul. Now, the other thing too is for people that know people that don't believe the same thing, it's not that they're less than you. That's not what we're saying, but when you marry somebody or even if you enter into a relationship with somebody who doesn't believe what you believe, you can't just assume they're going to change their views for you. Right. You know, you shouldn't marry somebody or get in a relationship with somebody yeah. to change oh, I'll, them. I'll marry them and I'll change them. I'll, right. I'll help bring them to church. It doesn't work that way in the real life. Yeah, and for those of you that are listening that have maybe a story similar to that, please don't take our attitude as cavalier in a way that we're just saying, like, oh, you made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. This can be a really tough, um, very, very intense season of life and and one key like you know even with people that aren't married but they're doing the, what they call uh, what is it called missional dating missional dating what what's the problem with that when you enter into a relationship seeking to change the other person's belief structure you're already beginning to manipulate them yeah you are even if it's for the right intentions you are manipulating that person to try to get them to be someone that they currently are not and that's not your job right only God alone 
can do that and should do that. Yeah, imagine, you know, like, if you're, if you're entering into a relationship with somebody who doesn't have the same faith as you, it's not like it's a political thing where it's just it's just you know something you can change or something. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. You or can I'll stop just, arguing I'll just about keep it. it to myself. That's right. not your business. We're called to be outspoken about our faith, to reach people. And so imagine being in a marriage with somebody you're constantly dragging behind you who doesn't want to go to church with you, who doesn't want to do this with you, who doesn't want to pray. That's not what God d- designed marriage to be like. And if you're going to experience a true... Um, God honoring marriage, then you got to have somebody that's in it with you, not not fighting you at every turn to go away from God. Well said. The, the second half of this is I know that there are people that find themselves exactly in this scenario. Yeah. They didn't plan on it, but that's just where they are. The best course of action, truly, I believe, is prayer. Yeah. You've got to go to the Lord. You've got to ask Him to change your heart and then potentially to change the heart of your spouse. Many Christians, I think, are going to say, oh, you you shouldn't have to put up with that. You shouldn't have to deal with that. You need to be happy. They'll say whatever it is, you know, reason why you should leave your non-believing spouse. I'd say even if you're justified in that, it doesn't mean you should. Your marriage is worth fighting for, and God can redeem anything, any relationship that that we humanly think this is impossible, too much damage has been done. God can redeem it. He's in the business of redemption. Don't give up on it. Go to him in prayer. Pray that God would work in your life and in your marriage. Also, if you look in 1 Corinthians 7, 12, because this is particular to that um, issue, it says, Now I will speak to the rest of you. Though I do not have a direct command from the Lord, this is wisdom from Paul, if a Christian man has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him or staying married to him, he must not leave her. That's right. So, you know, it could be easy, and in the, in the long run, it's probably not easy to divorce. Um, I come from a divorce family. I know how tough that that can be on future generations. Um, but, you know, don't enter into a relationship with somebody who doesn't believe the same thing. But if you find yourself, maybe you became a Christ follower during your marriage, but you weren't, they weren't a Christ follower, your yep. uh, partner, your spouse, um, don't just leave. I mean, you could have a profound impact on them, but also know that you can't just expect them to convert and to become a believer just because you are. Yeah, and of course, there are the scenarios of abuse. There are scenarios of one of the members of the marriage not being faithful. There's all sorts of different scenarios. We don't have time to get into all of those. If you find yourself in danger, absolutely take the steps needed to protect yourself. But it's maybe even more important to protect your heart. Yeah, and, and if you find yourself in situations like that, talk to your pastor. Um, in, in any situation that we've talked about tonight, talk to your pastor, somebody you can trust, somebody can give you good spiritual counsel. Fine, wise counsel. Love yeah. It. So in conclusion, uh, we, we've seen that Ezra is a book about acknowledging God's protection and provision and guidance in our lives. He is right there with you no matter what. I mean, perhaps maybe you've gone away from God, uh, but it's never too late to come back. That's right. As I said earlier, God is in the business of redemption. And no matter where you currently find yourself or the state of your heart, go back to God, honor him, worship him. Even if you don't know the right words to say to him, find some time alone and just speak truthfully. If you want to get mad at God and yell at him a little bit, he can take it. Yeah. Pour your heart out to him and he will hear every word that you say. And he is in the business of redeeming you. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. Seek him and you will find him. Yeah, that's great words. Next week, we're going to talk about one of the greatest leadership books in the Bible. One of your favorites, right? I'm excited. Yeah, it's Nehemiah, a man who led the third group back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. We're going to be talking about what it means to have a holy discontent. I can't wait. Let's do it. See you later.